Uh, my name is Abhimanyu. The topic that I want to pick up today is uh, building a bookshelf using bookshelf.js. And ember.js is what I'll be using as the UI front end kind of the technology. So it's going to be a simple application. It's uh, from an end-to-end -end perspective, it is going to be, you can see a list of books. You click on a book, you can see the details of the book and all. You can add a book if you want, etc, etc. Right? So, let's get started. Cool. So, what is the problem with uh, handling data using Node.js today? So, if you were using Node.js, how would you be typically interacting with the database? Say Mongo or MySQL. Read so you you write the queries, right? So it's it's a massive select blah 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 blah. What do you think is the problem that comes out of writing it in a stringified form? Spelling mistakes? Errors of querying and then your business logic gets I mean complicated and your queries get complicated. And you require something, then you have to mess up with the police. What else? I mean, that's obviously a very big problem. Anything else? It's also be very unstructured. Uh, yes. Unstructured. What, what do you mean? I mean, queries normally will require unstructured. Uh, yes. List. Yes. What about the process and list? Yes, that's also a problem. Parameterization is a problem. So obviously there are a lot of problems that we face and you know you end up feeling something like this, like crap loads of work to do and no real way out. Right. So this is what the problem is. And in comes what is called as an ORM. So what is an ORM? The relationship between you and Yes, yes, absolutely. So can can you guys give me an example of an ORM, you know, simple ORMs that we have used in our day to day lives? So we have Hibernate and just we have link to SQL for .NET. We have KPHP, Core Data. Yes. But what's there for JavaScript? I mean, when I'm using Node.js, Node.js is like amazing, right? You can write things really fast, dynamically type, and all that jazz. Why do we not have a ORM for JavaScript? It really makes you feel sad, right? This JavaScript just, you know, it is such a nice thing, but we don't have an ORM. No easy. And hence I introduce you to Bookshelf.js. So Bookshelf.js is an ORM for JavaScript. Essentially, you write it with Node. And it allows you to do anything and everything that a traditional ORM will allow you to do only with JavaScript. Right? Sounds pretty neat. So let's see what, you know, ORM really helps us with. So, why Bookshelf? Uh, apart from Bookshelf, we also have things like SQLize, which have already been there. But there's a reason why I picked Bookshelf. So the reason was I was looking for a Bookshelf application and we found Bookshelf.js. <laughs> the good part about it is it's structured very much like Backbone. How many of you have worked with Backbone.js? How about uh, Ember? Anybody on Ember? So just like in Backbone, you have uh, you have you extend from a model and you put in the properties. You have a similar kind of structure that you use with Bookshelf as well. So we'll we'll get into the details later. And just like you can just do a model dot method name equal to some function and just invoke the method, you can do the same with Bookshelf dot chains. It's promises. So I know Pradeep just came and mentioned that we all hate promises, but Promises are not bad. And if you don't like promises, it also does support the old callback mechanism. So it's up to you whether you want to go down the promises route or the callback route, both of them are supported. Dynamic relationships, right? So you have a table and you have basically two tables and you want them to map to each other by say, uh, you know, I have one laptop. So this laptop belongs to me. So I need to create this relationship. Ideally, if I was using MySQL, what would my query look like? It would be a join, right? 
and let's say i want uh, i want to t- pick up a post which uh, i want to pull, pull out the comments from a table i want to pull out the author from a table i want to pick out tags from another table that's going to turn out to be a massive massive join right and writing this massive massive join in strings is going to be a big headache for me so if i have something like relationships where i can very very easily define that this guy has many comments this post belongs to an author things like that make my life much easier right and it has custom queries and schemas so bookshelf is essentially built on top of a library called as next.js so next.js is a query builder for javascript where uh, how many of you from c sharp fish background yes <laughs> so people who work with c sharp would ideally know the i think it's there for javascript also you can do a dot something dot something dot something so instead of actually writing uh, select star from some table where something order by something next allows you to translate it into a something dot select dot where dot this thing and you just put in your parameters and your equality and inequality inside the where clause right making less mistakes turn by turn so if you find yourself in a situation where bookshelf is not quite providing you the right query that you want go ahead and write it yourself then we look at custom schemas so what do you mean by custom schemas very simply put i have a node.js application i want everyone to have it can i make sure that everyone goes and creates the same tables on their machines and then they can start using my schema so oh, that's stupid right so what can i do i do a very simple thing i create my schema using bookshelf so when if somebody runs the application bookshelf will create those tables for you and deploy them on say my sql or sql lite or maria sql depending upon whatever you are using depending on the configuration that you provide right so gradually reducing headaches i am not taking the headache of creating the tables i don't worry about what data types my columns are going to be is it a varchar 10 is it a varchar 11 it really doesn't matter because bookshelf will handle that as well for you making your life easier but if uh, i think it's supported that schema is already existing yes absolutely so i'm going to demonstrate with existing schema only so you get gets you thinking right it's it's kind of solving all of my problems it's, it seems really neat so you know let's get started about it so let's see what so we have the various queries that you can have right so i'm just going to go over the queries before i deep dive into the examples so you have you can do a fetch you can do a fetch all which is a which is like a get a get all a save you can do an update every simple thing that you can do and the relationship that we spoke about we said it it, it you can be it can be an has many relationship a belongs to relationship or even a belongs to will, many relationship so a has many would be a one to n a belongs to will be a one to one or more like a has one and a belongs to many is an end to end relationship right so sounds quite promising so let's quickly have a look at the examples i'll just increase the font how do i do that so over here what i'm doing is i have uh, already created an application it uses ember js and uh, so since people are not familiar with ember js i'm going to quickly get into ember js and get out of it so that everyone is on the same page right so ember js is an mvc framework like angular js or backbone js or knockout or whatever there are certain things which are good about ember js which is why i really like it a lot so ember js works on a concept of templates so you structure your entire application in terms of small 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 templates so you say this is my template which is going to render a book this is a template which renders a, an author this is a template which renders a list of books right so typically when i just write when i don't give a template a name it is the root template means the thing that i'll see when i 
land on the application. So over here, if I look at my code, it you know basically has a navigation here, etc., etc., and it has something called as an outlet. So in in traditional ASP.NET or master page concept, so this is like a master page template. So the outlet is the container, is the placeholder container. So for every page, everything will be rendered as is and the outlet will be replaced by whatever current template I am on. How do I decide the current template? By the route, by the URL that I see. Ember works very very closely with your URLs. So if you are on a slash book URL, Ember has enough intelligence to know that the template I want to render is going to be called book. I am going to use a book view, I am going to use a book controller, my model is going to be something called as a book and my route is a book route. So it works in a very Ruby like fashion, it convention over configuration, right? You really don't think about okay, now that I have defined this, let me point this guy to that route and this is my controller, hence that is my model. No need to do all of that, Ember will figure all of it out by itself, hence reducing the lines of code that you are writing for creating an application, right? So beyond that we see we just have uh, a lot of uh, the index template and everything and it follows the handlebars syntax. So have, have, has anybody used mustache or handlebars? So mustache is a templating uh, engine, framework, something like that. So basically what mustache allows you to do is if my server side has certain values that I want to put on the UI. One way is that I use jQuery and I say div and then I open it and you know stringify the entire div, put some values inside it, hectic task. Alternatively I use mustache which basically takes a syntax like this, this one say for example and it says you know for each book in the model. A very readable kind of a syntax. I want you to iterate over my model and pick out every book and this entire div will be repeated for every book in the model. If I have 10 books, it will just repeat itself for 10 books. So I don't need to go and write 10 different divs for me to be doing this. Right? And then I just bind to every property and I give it certain fields and values and whatever. Right? So this is mustache. Am I going too fast? It's fine? Sure? Cool. So yeah, whatever. This is uh, this is the HTML. Now we look at the JavaScript bit of it. So this is uh, the Ember bit. So we just say Ember application create. Now the moment that I write that, Ember knows that this is an Ember application, right? Then I go ahead and define my routes. So I said I have a route called as author which is basically the path for that will be slash author slash some author id right it can be author slash one two three four why do we have a syntax like this i'll come to that in a bit similarly we have books and add books and whatever so whenever we say my index route is my root so we saw a template called as index i have not defined a route as index though now i have just i'm defining a index route for it where i want the model to give me a book object, right? So Ember is has now wired up everything by itself. So it has it knows that when I'm at the root location, when my URL is root, I will render the index template, right? I will use the index route, and the model for the index route I have defined to be there's nothing called as an index model. I don't have one. So I'm saying I just want you to find a book. When I say find a book. Since I have not specified what book I want you to find, it will just go ahead and find all books. This particular syntax is what is handled by the Ember data. Normally what would you do? You would write a Ajax request, right? You will create a massive Ajax where you say this is the URL, this is something, this is something. You don't really need to do that because I can just say find it. I have never defined what store is or what is my URL. So what is, what is my URL at this point of time? So Ember says, if I'm going to find book, my URL is slash books. So if I have a service which is which has a method at slash books, Ember is happy about. It. Doesn't really matter, right? So then I say, what is the books route? And now I say I want you to find a book by a particular ID. 
So you see this particular syntax, so underscore ID, this is why I had that syntax in place. So when I want to look at a one particular book, I will just find my book. If I want all books, I just find all books, right? And this is the beauty of Ember data now. Works very, very seamlessly and very beautifully with, you know, making our life very easy, right? So similarly, I want to look at an author. It's the same code again, right? You just get a list of authors. And similarly for everything, you know, how you'd create a book or whatever. Correct me if I'm wrong, I have one query, right? This is your app.js file. Can you scroll up a bit? Yeah. So you are defining the uh, so when the router dot maps yeah. and this being node project so as far as I know we also do it in app dot js. This is the client side app dot js. This is not node yet. I have not stepped into node right now. Okay. So this is a client side. This is the client side JavaScript. Okay. Just one file. Uh -huh. And again, it, the client side essentially has two files right now. One is index dot html. The second is app dot js. That's all. That's the only part we have covered till now. I'll get to the node bit now. You can see I have two app dot js's there, right? Ah, so that one is the node one. Can feel like when you hit a URL, mm -hmm. so that URL is specified in the node app dot js also, and the same URL is specified over here. No. Also. So what is happening here is that I'm not letting node control my routes. So node is basically a server layer phone. Node is just attending to myself. So I'm not using Jade or I'm not using node responses to render the view. Node basically acts as a servicey kind of a layer for me. And the entire UI routing logic is handled by Ember. Because frankly, Ember does more elegantly. So, so this <laughs> route, right, they will be uh, fixed by the hash. Right? Yes. That way, all the requests that you make to this route they are uh, actually make the request made to the same page. You are not going to the server or these routes. So, this is the actual single page so application. Yes. yes. Similar, yes. Absolutely similar. They they solve the purposes. This thing is basically, I think it's called uh, fake routing or something, fake URLs or something like that. There is an actual library that is there which allows you to create the hash slash URL kind of a mapping. You can do, you can just pull it up and create your own routes if you want. I'm forgetting the name, I think it's fake routing or pseudo routing or something like that. This has, this has become more popular when you started with uh, single page application. Yeah. So there is only one HTML file. Then one HTML file basically has all of your templates. And you really don't need to worry about creating 15 files and your, your stuff loading everywhere. No need to worry about that. This uh, also also uh, into tracking history. Yes. Like back and forth. Exactly. Like previous button, yeah. next button. I mean, because it's a single page, you, if you are going back uh, in any other normal application, you will get back uh, the previous page, but there is only one page. Yes. 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 So that's the good part of it. So the philosophy being that you can literally take the URL and give it to somebody and the state of the page is maintained. So the state doesn't change when you are, you know, out of context of a browser, put it into a different browser, the state really doesn't change. <coughs> Yeah, so so this was the UI bit of it, right? The UI is handling the views and everything. And what does my model look like? So this is my model. My model basically has uh, uh, it has a, the book has a title, an author, an image, summary, price. So again, we see a belongs to here, right? And this is Ember Data's way of handling relationships. So when I have a belongs to an Ember, what Ember does is it will call book dot uh, it'll call the book service get the books from the author field it will take the author id and call the author service to get the author right so it will not make an embedded call it will make two distinct calls the advantage is that it will now cache the authors so if i have five books written by the same author i will never get the payload worth worth of five authors i will just get the author once and for every subsequent call the author is now cached for response so on a large scale, it helps you reduce a lot of calls, right? And over here, I have uh, the author, which has a first name, last name, and a list of books. So obviously, author has many books. And this thing is called as a computed property, where I say the full name of the author is a dependent of the first name and the last name. And how do I calculate the full name? I say the full name is first name, space, last name. That's it. So I don't bind first name and last name, I just bind a full name. 
obviously there are better examples to demonstrate this but again for the sake of simplicity this is what i'm sticking to so this is the model that i've used on my client side application if i was using backbone it would be, it would be similar if i was using angular i think it would still be similar or any mvc framework my model would still look extremely similar to what it is now right so let's hop on to the app.js node so over here this is the part where i have defined next so i say next is basically uh, my sql client the connection is this the user is this the uh, database i'm using is bookshelf and i define bookshelf as a bookshelf which takes next as a parameter since bookshelf requires next to be built so i define my configuration with next allowing me to now query using next and bookshelf just wraps up next and gives me the values that i expected to give me right and then i have definitely the routes that you know we have defined so i will basically be covering these many so it's it's a uh fetch fetch all and save on books and authors but we'll just go over about the cool stuff so uh let's look at book.js right it has the list it has the get and it has the add method they will eventually return us whatever we want similarly the author will also have the same thing right you have the list you have the get and the add methods right now let's get cracking so i define author as and with this line essentially i have created an author object which is type of a bookshelf obviously now i need to point it to a table name because i don't know what table name author is going to point to so what i can do is very simply say And that's it so now i have something called as an author which now points to a table name called as authors right so if i look at the get the list call that i might have i'll basically have a new author dot fetch all and then this is a promise of it i just return authors as is right so what does my database look like Where name type one. Ah, ठीक है. So this is my authors table where it just has first name and last name. Now there is obviously a very blatant problem here where I have first name as first underscore name and my last name is last underscore name, which means the response that I now take is going to give me. something which looks like a first underscore name and a last underscore name whereas when we saw embjs it had camel casing right not snake casing so there are two ways you handle things like this either you say my ui will handle it and you put it in the ui logic but since we are not talking about bookshelf we will try and handle it in bookshelf so one good thing that comes from using bookshelf is bookshelf is bundled with underscore as well and where you have underscore you can use underscore dot reduce to basically take your uh, snake case and convert it to camel case and vice versa right so there are two methods that bookshelf defines they are called the parse and the for the responsibilities of these two methods are essentially to convert the database response to your service response or your model and the other way around right so things i've already written it down so this is a model that you will find right so you say that You you're going to have a format method where the format is just going to underscore your values, and the parse is going to snake case your values, right? 
So I'm using inflection here. It's very commonly used nowadays for all of this manipulation that we use, fluidization, camel casing, disco and etc. They have very similar function signatures. Now the reason why I'm binding it to the bookshelf.model.extend is that I wanted to apply to all of my models. So I say by default, this will apply to all of my models. And now instead of my author inheriting from bookshelf.model, it will just inherit from that model. Ah. Right. And with that one change, now my first underscore name and last underscore name will automatically start coming to me as first name and last name. But there is still one thing that we are missing, right? We have not bound the books attribute because every author has a list of books. And hence I will introduce you to the relationships. So I will say books is basically a function. Now we can actually say that a book has, uh, an author has many books. So what exactly is this book that we are talking about? Is the same thing that we will create here. So we will actually say book is format model extent and the table name is Books. Right? So now we say we have somebody called as a book, which points to a table called as books. We have author pointing to a table called as authors. And books essentially has a. So the author has something called as books, which is basically a collection of books. But when we look at the SQL database, we notice that the table really does not have anything called as books, right? Which is, which is a problem. It, it's supposed to have something called as books. I really don't need to because my books table has the author ID. So now I come to a point where I need to somehow find a way to join these two, to get a response where I want all books written by this particular author, right? Now how would you normally do it? What would be your SQL query? Select books from that particular table where author ID equals to particular. I want the author as well, right? So this is a classic join. Let's start from uh, uh, author comma books. Books dot author dot ID equal to authors.id. Yes, that is true. Yes, there, there are so many ways of doing it. So let's see how Bookshelf prescribes we do this. So I'm looking at the get request for author. The reason I'm not writing it right now is because it will take time. So I say that uh, obviously the request that I get, I extract the author ID from it. And then I say dot fetch. What it's going to do is it's going to fetch. What do I fetch? I want you to fetch all related books. That's it. Fetch with related books. So if I have four relationships, I will just say fetch uh, with related books, comma tags, comma comments, comma blah blah blah, whatever. It does not matter to me, right? And it'll just go ahead and give me everything, right? So how do I get the relation bit? So I just say the author, which is returned by the promise, dot related books. And it will give me the related books as an array, right? And over here, what I'm doing is it's just mapping and putting the IDs into one field so that I can send the IDs to embers. 
So this is just a mapping bit. Essentially, what I wanted to show here is how the relationships are handled. And where we spend so there are like three ways of querying uh, the database for get me this, where this, and this, or something like that. I don't really have to care about that. Whether it's a has many, whether it's yes, sorry. Yeah, so is it going to fetch books in a know, for every author call, so I'll get the books and all other relationships? Yes, if you want it to. Depending upon how you write the fetch. If you don't want, you just remove the word related bit, it'll just fetch the author for you. But yeah. Uh, so uh, is there a no way to say eager and lazy, something like that? This is eager. You can yeah, do what yes, but there's a problem with this. I mean, I think is that let's say if I have forty authors, so it will be forty and the book, is it for the books? Yes. No, it's just one still one query, right? It's not querying the books separately. For every author, it is querying that. Yes, so for for the yes, it is. So so it will it, it, it will, will, it will query. queries to the DB. Yes. Is there a way to see the query uh, I do not know. I have not seen it. I, I can tell you how many it will make. So, by default, it's supposed to be the loading. Right. It will make 41 queries. No, it's the context of this particular call. Yes. It one depends one. where I am here, right? No, no, so you have a list of all. You select one of the other. You get on to the other. Oh, it is context that when I click on. Yeah, yeah, so that is what it's doing, right? It is picking up an author ID and calling with respect to an author ID. I'm not doing a fetch all. So if I do a fetch all, this, that's the fetch all call. So then it, it will not uh, pull up all the. So a fetch all for authors will give you one query, which is a fetch all of books. Oh. So let's say when I do fetch all, right. right? When I get an author's list, right. does it also has the books or not? No. Right. So over here, what I've yeah, sorry. What is if I want on? You can do a with related again, but then it will make those many number of calls. But then you would anyways make them right when you do a join. So if you were doing it in if say doing in a join and, and, and in typical hibernate and some what I would do, you know, in one when I say select star from other, it will simply fire a query select star from other, you know. Uh, jo uh, join on and then they'll do a, do a join and everything. And then we do the, all the object mapping and all. Yes. So that is one thing. Over here it will get just one author and get another call to get one more. So essentially it probably boils down to the same. I'm not that good with databases. But no, what do you think? Does it does it boil down to the same or join and no, it call? Is it too vast? I mean it, 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 this is going to give me a hard time, uh, let's say if I am pulling up a thousand records or something, right? So, but you will not want all the relationship, and you want all the records. It would depend upon Maybe what you want, right? I, I might be able to click on one author, and I would like to see. Yes. So when you click on an author, at that time you make another get for only for that author. You can. Yeah. But what if? So in in this case, let's assume that you are seeing the details of a book. The book requires you to have no need for you. Details of the books the author has has, has published. So my overall question is, you know, revolving around if you go to the model. So in the model, is there no other way to say, you know, use another model? As in, uh, if you go to the author definition. Uh, so here, Shami, can we show? Is there an app built that we can we see it in browser? Yes, we can. So should we show that? Yeah, first I will show that. I need to finish this first. Okay. Okay. Uh, it just gives a Okay, so I I think it should be working. Because typically what you have is a summary page and you will see all the authors, let's say. And then you say I'm interested in this guy's book, so I want to keep that guy. Like a master That's where it will just fetch the summary page wouldn't fetch all the books for the particular author. So this is this is the summary page. Summary and is it a five books or book count or something like that. You don't show all the print ones. You will be able to write down. It's like a response. Uh, so you have a URL. So you get the details, and for you get the summary. And for the details you have, you are able to. Yeah. Because in this case, it is one to many, right? 
Yes. So let's take an example of employee and department. Okay. So I would like to display uh, employee and the department name. Right. So in that case, it doesn't work right? because the, there it's a one to one. A one to one would work no, perfectly. Sorry, right? like one to many. Yeah. So. It this is also what is your starting point. You want to start as an employee or with the department? Yeah. No, but uh, let's say if I would like to display you know, just the name and the department, employee name and the department name. Yeah, right. then you use the employee model for displaying all the employees. Right. Correct. And in the get for the employee, you get the department So when you see the details of one particular author, then only will you be expected to know about this. So when I look at this, it's just the author names, right? It just has this first name, this is the last name of the author with a list of books. If I go into details of the books, I will still see the book details, nothing related to the author. Only when I go into the authors will it now want to get the books written by the author, right? So it's not that it's now querying the books database at this point of time, right? This this is not Ember by the way. This is Bookshelf. So Ember handles the UI side of it. So the reason why Ember is also useful at that point of time is this Ember usually allows you to not uh, get an embedded data. It would always always want you to get uh, a side loaded relationships. Right? So you will have a response that gives you IDs, it will query with those IDs, get other responses. So in most cases, you really don't need to worry about, okay, how is this going to happen? So the reason why I am actually casting it into the, uh, the ID type of format is because that is what Ember data will support straight out of the box. If we go, want to go into the details, that, then you basically will have to override certain stuff in Ember and this really doesn't have to change. Right, that's again Ember data's advantages. We are looking at this. Um, the other thing is that when we look at the with related bit, right, so over here this is going to fire a very very simple with related query where it's going to say, okay, man, uh, I want you to find all books with this particular author. So I have not specified the field name or anything as such. So what this guy is going to do is it is going to singularize the, the model table name. So when I say with related books, it is going to look for something called as book underscore ID, which means uh, when sorry for author, it has, will look for author underscore ID in the table called as books. So by default, it will look for books dot author underscore ID. Now that is a problem for me because what if I don't have something called as author underscore ID, right? So I need a way to specify that instead of going to author underscore ID, go to say something called as author, right? And that is something you can just define over here. So the relationship allows you to specify a table and a foreign key. So I want to say that I have many books and I wanted to refer this particular column. So looking at this thing, I have the field called as author. It's not called author ID. Right? So I will So what I will add here is And now it will start looking for books dot author. Assume that you know uh, one book is written by three authors. Okay. So we have uh, in database we maintain this kind of structure where you know, have author one, author two, author three. I think most of the books are authored by one user, one uh, author, book written by one author. But there is a scenario, right? Now I have to mention that you know, this can only tell uh, all those columns that author one, author two, or author three. Okay, yes. Right. So in, in that case what you would do is uh since it's a so the one thing is that you can use a belongs to many instead of doing a has many. The second alternative is since it's a very specific case, what you can do is with related can actually take a query. 
So since with related can uh, is also something which will work with next. You can actually put up a function here, which can then say, okay, okay this is my query, and I want you to query where author one is this or this or this or this. So you can specify the kind of constraint you want to apply to the for key. So that I have just to say match author ID. Do I also want to match a type? Do I also want to match the country? Then you specify those particular contexts inside a custom query that you write with the with read. But once again, you will be using not a string based uh, format, but more of a what, what next gives. So you will have a function which gives you a query object, and the query object dot where will give you the with clause. And next and Bookshare both give you this uh, a very nice way of where they say where in and where unless and all that stuff so they wrap where with the not equal to greater than kind of a functionality we just specify the column name and the value and they just handle the rest by themselves here in this scenario we are not mentioning that you know what are the columns we require from book table for example in book you know we do have one Maybe PDF format of that book, or maybe the image, cover image of that book. Yes. Well. Yes. And uh, while querying author, I just want to need a uh, you know, book's name, not the PDF version blog or blog. Okay. So select it. Selective uh, columns, probably. On. Uh, not write that, so I do not know. So basically, here in this scenario, it will uh, go and it will get it all, all the yeah, yeah. books where author equal to this. There is a way, I'm pretty sure, but I don't know. Sorry. So, uh, the one thing that uh, I'm Bookshare.js also gives you is the JSON methods that you can use. So you have the dot to JSON, which will basically take your uh, take the response that you get from the database convert it into JSON. Now while it is doing a to JSON, what it is essentially doing is that it is going to call a set on your model. Right? It is going to take that value, set it on the model. So things like author dot related books, they uh, you don't get anything called as author dot books because that is not a part of the database response. That is something you have custom loaded as a relationship. So that comes in the form of a function where the function can resolve dot related books and return something to you. So the dot to JSON actually does a flattening of these relationship models as well. Plus what it will do in addition to this is that since I am inheriting from a format model, it will also put my camel case in place. So the database although has returned to me in snake casing, this to JSON will essentially just convert it to camel casing. If even if I don't write all of it, just this bit, res or json will also do the same thing, because uh, it will actually try and uh, flatten the entire string out. And while it does try to do that, it will flatten all of these functions and relationships into a flat model side by side. So, although this is unnecessary, but you can see here that I have not really done a two json or a stringify or anything. So it really gives you methods like you can do a json dot stringify or a do json if you want to be simple. So basically a lot of helper methods which you know make yeah. So uh, I mean definitely we talks about you know camel case and snake case where you know it is helping us mapping both of them. Assuming that you know uh, one of the developer created a module, you know front end module like F name or L name. Yeah. Which is definitely not at all the same. Yeah, yeah. So is it also helping somewhere or can we define it in Yes, you, you can pretty much define it where we put in the this thing. So when you have the parse or the format, say, let's just say you have put down everything is uh, first letter underscore something. So it has to be either a particular syntax. Now let's just say there is no particular syntax, right? Mm -hmm. This is very specific. But you want to say, okay, fine, my guy has put author to read something like this, right? You have f name and name. So what you can do here is, sorry, not here. over here when you are def defining author, what you do here is you define the parse and the format in author itself, right? Take the specific values and then just say f name is actually first name and l so name is actually l name. model specific, yes. for the rest yes. of the models it will work like camel is my Absolutely, uh, absolutely. So it the customization can happen either here or you can have it customized at the front end layer depending upon whatever you want to have. Right? 
and similarly what we do is we will have book uh, basically having one author which was there as a field anyways but <laughs> i want to actually get the author response as a part of the book as well so again there are two ways either i just get or i say that this book belong this that this book has an author which belongs to an author table so it has a very similar syntax so when i say return this dot belongs to author right and this means that i have something called as an author which belongs to the table author this is different from getting the id it's not about the same thing so it's about getting the actual author response as well so if you have the ui which understands embedded uh, service responses where i have books author author has an object inside it which has another object may be inside it you can easily map it using something like this if if you don't have it not a problem just use the existing model right so let's quickly have a look at uh, so let's quickly have a look at the lists uh, absolutely similar implementation as that of order nothing different at all uh let's look at get get does nothing different so it's not getting the author now right so there is no with related author call that is happening at this point of time i'm essentially just getting whatever is there in that right and similarly when i say new book i pass it an id whatever it was parameters i have right So let's uh, put this in action. And look at the app. Let's hope this works. So the books. Are what what was stored there? The values over here, the these one fifty only, is something which Ember is parsing for you. So the value stored in the database, if we have a look, is essentially hundred, one fifty, one fifty, etc., etc., etc. Right? So Ember is basically converting everything that it thinks is called a price, and it's putting a RS in front of it, and then only after it. Right? Uh, this is not the first name space last name this is the full name of the author so you just have a look at it right so let's just say i click on this particular book and this opens this particular page where i have so till now i have not really gone and asked for a lot of authors but now let's just say i want the books that agatha christi has written so i tap on more from agatha christi and now i have made two calls to the service server which gives me the two books right so right now we're just dealing with the book ids i'm not really looking at what books she has written but when i go into it now i can say okay fine these are the books that she has written right so this all of this is a very salient feature of empty uh, that is handling caching calls as well uh the fact that i really don't have to specify a model and essentially the only place that i specified the first name and last name is at the database level and then at my ui level and the entire service layer doesn't really care about first name last name title anything of that sort it's because both of them are now talking to at a very similar uh, model logic right they understand similar variables they understand similar names and it is now now i don't have to go ahead and write queries like you know select star from where first name is this it really doesn't have to be that way right can you elaborate on the sentence that you said the it just shows the value and it amends the rupees and only that ember takes care of it yes so um 
Ember works with something called as handlebars. Okay. So handlebars is, as I mentioned, it's a templating engine. So what you can do in handlebars is you can specify a helper. So what the helper does is the helper takes a value and it can modify that value. It's essentially like a computed property that we saw the full name property was. So what it does is that it will take a value and you can say, okay, fine, whatever value I have, I want to say rupees space value space only and return this value now. So for every price object it gets, it will just translate it into rupees space price space only. So if instead of 100, I got NAN, it will show rupees NAN only. <laughs> Right? So it is like a custom handlebar. Yes, it is just doing a string format. Yes. So Angular also uses uh, handlebars only. So we define the, this uh, 150 is price and we send it to the handlebar and get the return or the appended rupees and only as the return value. Yes. So we don't say if it is a price. So we say that I want you to take the book dot price and pass it through a helper. Yeah. Exactly. Right. So you just say is so we have a lot of helpers that we saw it. There was a link helper, there was each helper. Yeah. So you can just define a hash price and pass it book dot price. And it will take the price from the book and it'll just convert it into rupees something only. And we can just mind it. Yes, to definitely. Rupees or dollar. Yeah, dollar also <laughs> that's not a problem. Right? Uh, yeah. Can you show the network request and the JSON response So, this is the list of books that was loaded, right? And every book has an author. And depending upon the author, since I need to evaluate the first name and the last name of the author, I get a first name and the last name. The books is just returning me an index. There is no value for the books, right? Written up just these service calls. Yeah, so? So, first you get the push data, and then again for each author, for each uh, author for every book. Yes. But notice that I have, uh, so the book's response has uh, how many people? Seven? Eight. Seven, eight, yeah. And the author's call are 1, 2, 4, 5, 3, and 6. That's lesser than 8. So it's not that I'm calling the author for every book. If a book has multiple authors, sorry, if multiple books have one author, I will not make the call again. Because Ember Data is smart enough to know that with author ID X, this is the author. Let me cache and keep. Now keep an eye on this now, right? So we have got the authors, we have got books. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, no problem. So, the, uh, so that means uh, uh, by default it is by ID or somewhere uh, we specified in the model? No, we are not specified by model. So Ember handles it by itself. More reason why I love it. So I clicked on the book details of a book. No calls have been made. Not a single call has been made. So I got everything without making a single extra call. Now let's look at the details call. Since just one book, a single call has been. So the summary page has handled all of my calls and now I am not making any more calls. So Ember Data is handling all of this data for me. And what's even more neat is that if you look at the so this is a plugin for Chrome which gives you which shows you the Ember data. So I tap on Ember, it says that I have eight books and six authors. It has cached everything for me, right? And I can look at the books that are there and I can actually see what are the values that Ember has gotten them for me. Uh, how does it cache by session? Uh, it is the Chrome's cache. No, no. Browser cache. Yes, sorry, browser, browser cache. Browser cache. So, what is even better about Ember is, and I'm going more and more into Ember, 
is that it will also cache the templates that you were using. So once you have pretty much rendered a template, all it needs to do is recompile the same template. So it will not always get the template and rent, uh, compile it again and again. It will just put in those values again. So if you are familiar with jtemplate or handlebars, there is a pre-compile option and there is a compile option. The compile option will compile the entire template and the pre-compile will basically compile stuff that it can without putting in the values. So error will essentially just store everything it can. So does ember data. So no calls whatsoever. So is it true that if I render the index page and my index page is around 100 books, so it will cache the data for all 100 books and yes. no further network no. calls will be made? So if you, if you load them in the same view, if it's a scrolling view, then as and when you scroll, the books come, they get cached, they get stored. Easy to do. Yes. What is the issue? How does that store? All those kind of data we should cache into the browser. As soon as we load the more data, probably get like a lot of nice frames. Maybe the browser. So, uh, general data that is practiced on it. Well, it depends when you want to invalidate the session. Ideally, if you have a session concept, you want to invalidate everything that is a part of a session. But for something like this, if you have a hundred objects, then you probably have to disable the cache at certain point of time or have a lazy loading mechanism which removes certain elements from the cache and puts in certain elements back based on some amount of logic. So is there a way that uh, invalidate the cache by an element because you know, on my server? That Possible, is, yes. I, okay, there is. Yes. Ember, I think it allows you to invalidate parts of the cache as well. So it can allow you to dis discard the cache for a certain route. No, no, I mean to say that let's say my book price has been changed or something, the content has been changed. Not for this kind of static. Oh, okay. Uh, so let's say uh, I'm listing our employees and at the same time somebody uh, wow. from somewhere uh, will change the name or something that, you know, when I am so you, for that you'll use something of a real-time database. Let's take for example Firebase. So Ember has an integration with Firebase called as Ember Fire, which basically taps into the Firebase APIs and gives you promises, right? So when as soon as Firebase updates itself, it updates the Ember data model. And since Ember data got updated, it updates Ember model UI. and updates the UI. So this is what is called as a three-way data binding. It was first introduced by Angular Fire right. as an integration with Angular uh, JS and Firebase. And then it came to Ember as well. It's called Ember Fire. So, yes. But the good part is that till you don't. <laughs> uh, I can enough of the page or enough of the application and you can use that and it will still be able to connect. Yes. Good for your offline. Yes, it will still allow you to at least navigate. Yeah. Since and, and since also a single page application, all your JavaScripts and everything, CSS files have already been loaded once. So no subsequent calls for them will be made. So also can I encrypt uh, the Ember data? Possible, yes. So, so how? So this is going more towards Ember data. I see. So how Ember data works is uh, it it has multiple layers. So you obviously have the view controller, etc. So the controller from the controller to the service, it goes through two people. One is the adapter. One is the serializer. Yes. So you can configure the serializer to do whatever you want with the data. So like for example, when we over here in the uh, responses, we saw that So over in the responses, we saw that there was a books call followed by author, 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 author. So what you can ideally do is if your service returns an embedded response, you can actually take take it in the serializer, convert it into a side loaded response so that Ember doesn't by itself make the second call. So you can configure all of these things in the serializer. And the good part 
a better part about the serializer is that the serializer can be configured per route. So you can say my posts want to be serialized like this, my books want to be serialized like this, my authors want to be serialized like this. So while it gives you a very plain and simple way of handling things, it also gives you the power of customizing whatever you want. Right? So wow, I'm running low on time, I guess. So just one last bit that is left is to look at the add method. So I'm sorry, I'm really late. So what happens is uh, Bookshelf gives you a forge method where you can basically create an object on the fly. So whatever response we get from it, we can actually say forge title is this, image is this, image whatever, and just save it. And with that one comment, you can save whatever is that you have gotten from member. Now, the reason why I am actually passing via a forge and not assigning it directly because I want to demonstrate the forge method. Alternatively, I can just take this book, which pretty much has the same model as uh, Ember and the service, and I can pass it to the safe. I don't really need to go through uh, the forge method, but the forge is a very important method. It allows you to create things on the fly without really having to worry about what is the thing that you are creating. Um, a couple of more good things about Bookshelf is that uh, it, it allows you to have constructors. So just like uh, I think Pradeep mentioned with regards to uh, TypeScript, if you have a constructor, what you can do with this thing is that you have a constructor which specifies default values. So you can say by default my first name will be empty and my last name will be empty. And then you can just pass it. The second good thing, which which I am I really admire, is that suppose when I'm calling the save method, I don't want to do an insert, but I want to do, do an update. Right? So the save method ideally is an insert or update. So it will ideally always look for whether this is something new or this is something old. How do I define that? If while I'm calling the save method, I, if I pass it an ID param, right? So it'll look for that ID and update everything that I have passed to it. So if I just want to pass one value, it'll just go ahead and take that one value and no, it will not really require the rest of the values to be present. So I really don't need to think about two other methods that I have to write. Well, okay, fine. So this is an update. Let me go ahead and update it. I really don't need to worry about that. All I do is a save method with just a different parameter and it turns into an ins an update method. Right. Cool. I think I have covered it. Right? Yes. Parsing for now. Yes, I support it for Bookshelf. Um, there are a lot of things that Bookshelf uh, covers. The intention of this talk was not to cover all of them, but to basically give everyone an insight so that you guys can uh, take a stab at it and try it out in, in your own ways. Because from what my experience has been with this particular thing is that uh, there are multiple ways of doing it. You don't really have to stick to say just you know do a fetch like this and that is the only right way of doing it. You can do it in multiple ways and every way has certain benefit or every way has certain drawbacks. The biggest advantage it provides out of the box is that it makes your code much more readable, probably even much more maintainable and you make less errors. The moment I remove strings from my code and I start dealing with real methods, the chances that I'm going to make an error reduce drastically because then node will start throwing exceptions at me. So yeah, that's it. So I think it right now supports only three adding events because, it, uh, yes. because the remaining all are not event driven. That's why. Yes. Okay. So it currently supports Maria, SQLite, and MySQL. Postgres. Postgres, well, yes. So SQL like databases. <laughs> I, I know a lot of people don't use SQL, but still it's a good thing.
So, I think yeah, definitely there would be transactions. There are transactions, yes. So, it, it has dynamic relationships, it has transactions, it has e loading. Any, anything, everything that you can think of, every ORM provides, it does provide all of that. So, it's pretty cool. Awesome, thank you.